So our speaker this afternoon, our keynote speaker, is uh, Professor Ram Sashadri. And uh, Ram is a professor of materials here at UCSB, and he's also a member of the Materials Research Lab. He's been here since uh, 2002. And he uh, works on inorganic materials and magnetism. And he's going to be talking us to us today about magnetism, an old phenomenon with new surprises. Ram? Uh, thank you for coming here and thanks for listening to me this afternoon. So I was asked to speak about the research I do, which is largely on magnetic materials and the phenomenon of magnetism. And uh, it very quickly struck me that uh, if I did start speaking about my research, you'll fall asleep uh, in, a, in a matter of minutes. <laughs> so I am actually going to tell you a little bit about what we do. But most of the talk is really going to be a little bit about the history of magnetism and the different kinds of magnetism and how we understand magnets, so on and so forth. And I'm also going to try and do a few demos. And uh, as you're well aware, these demos may work or they may not work. I mean, they, <laughs> that is the nature of demos. So <clears throat> I'm just going to take a little, a, a, a few moments to tell you about the research that we do in our group here in UCSB with my graduate students and postdocs. So one of the things we spend quite a lot of time doing is making new magnetic materials. For example, uh, we, we have a big interest in making magnetic nanoparticles. Ah, good, I found my mouse. So this, for example, is a very small particle. You see the scale bar here, 10 nanometers. You see these little dots there. Uh, these dots, they look like atoms, but they aren't atoms. They're actually columns of atoms seen in a transmission electron micrograph. So this is really a very small magnet. You can actually, if you're patient enough, you can sit and count the number of atoms that it has, and you'll probably count some few hundreds to a few thousand. So we research materials like this, and this is the first uh, topic I've listed here. Another thing we do is we've increasingly become interested in looking at multifunctional magnetic materials, combining magnetism with other functionalities. For example, we are very curious about whether we or anyone else could ever make a transparent magnet. If you've ever seen magnets, like the ones that stick on your refrigerator, they're uh, invariably either, they either have metallic luster or they are black. Uh, you never ever see transparent magnets. Can one make transparent magnets. And this is actually uh, a very, very uh, challenging uh, scientific question to be asking. So that's what we, I refer to as multifunctional. Magnetism plus another functionality, in that case, transparency. We also explore something <coughs> called half-metallic magnets. This is a relatively new field, uh, but it's becoming very important because these so-called half-metallic magnets, and I'm not going to describe them today, these so-called half-metallic magnets are very important for magnetic hard disk drives, for reading the data of a magnetic hard disk drive. And finally, a class of materials that is of great interest to us. Again, this is relatively new. So these are all the, the new surprises that I, I referred to are what are called spintronic materials, and I'll describe these briefly towards the end of it. So, these are the things we work on, and uh, here are the typical tools that we use. Uh, uh, if some of you have time after, the, after this talk, I can take you down to the lab and show you what we call a squid magnetometer. Squid stands for superconducting quantum interference device. You know, scientists like acronyms. <laughs> uh, and uh, no one ever says superconducting quantum interference device, at, at least not in polite conversation. 
so I, I can show you what we call a squid magnetometer, which we use in-house. We also extensively use what are referred to as national facilities, large user facilities where we go and do our experiments. Here is one, it's called, it's a, it's, it's called a neutron diffractometer and this is the scheme of it. It's a rather, it's a room sized instrument that has a neutron beam coming in where it says beam here and this beam comes from something called an accelerator and this uh, experiment is set up at Los Alamos, New Mexico in the Los Alamos National Lab <laughs> and we use uh, facilities like this also to characterize our magnetic materials. But as I said, this is not what we're going to talk about today. Today I'm going to tell you a little bit about magnets and a little bit of, about their history, so on and so forth. So, how do we understand magnets? Magnets have actually been known for a long time. So, uh, as I will sh tell you, there are these naturally occurring minerals called lodestone or magnetite that, that stick to one another. So they've been known for a long time, and the ancient Greeks thought they'd understood the phenomenon well. They required only two fundamental forces to account for all natural phenomena. One was love and the other was hate. Uh, I should tell you that uh, I was reading the LA Times some days ago, and I was reading one in one of these uh, columns, uh, uh, I forget the name of the column, one of these agony aunt things, where uh, I read that hate is not the opposite of love, the opposite of love is indifference. So the Greeks, <laughs> the Greeks had that wrong. Anyway, one was love and the other was hate and this was a theory proposed by Empedocles around 450 BC and it was much improved by Aristotle. And for about 2000 years these were the theories that people were using. Our uh, current uh, understanding of magnetism is somewhat different. We don't uh, tend to invoke love and hate. Things would probably be simpler if we did. So the Greeks knew, for example, that magnetic powers would be lost when magnets were rubbed with garlic, but fortunately they could be recovered when treated with goat's blood. And uh, this description, incidentally, is from uh, a book written by one of my colleagues, Jacob Israel, actually in the materials department and the chemical engineering department here in UCSP. The book is titled Intermolecular and Surface Forces. So the uses of magnetism, I mean, traditionally, magnetism has had many uses, and even today, you know, of, uh, of uh, shall we say, less usual uses for magnetism, such as magnetic footwear to improve your mood and so on. So you can use magnets uh, at least the Greeks and others knew that you could use them in love potions, you could use them to cure diseases. In fact, for, for upset stomachs 200 years ago, doctors might have prescribed magnetism and warm ale. Okay, I, uh, frankly, of the, of, if given the choice, I'd choose magnetism. <laughs> I'd, I would do without the warm ale. Uh, of course, magnetism came with some cons. Magnetism was known to induce thievery, so the powers of a magnet could make thieves out of people and magnets uh, um, could induce people to tell lies and so on. So this is, this is, shall we say, this was current understanding a few hundred years ago. Uh, what were the early magnets? So there is this natural mineral, it's called lodestone. And uh, today we know that much of lodestone is this iron oxide, Fe3O4, with the formula um, Fe3O4 and it's either called ferrite or magnetite, that, that's, the, that's the name of, of this material, Fe3O4. It's dark grey, somewhat soft and it's actually a curious thing that these lodestones are permanent magnets. I'll come back to this point about permanent magnets or hard magnets. It's curious that they retain their magnetism uh, and uh, I'll try and explain what I mean by this. The term magnetite itself and the word magnetism, it comes from Magnesia, which is a which is region in, in Turkey, modern day Turkey, uh, a region that's considered Asia Minor. And uh, in fact, uh, because so many terms have been derived from this one root, it can sometimes get rather complex. So Magnesia itself is magnesium oxide. Okay, so and magnesium oxide is not magnetic. And the, 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 the metal manganese also has a term deriving from magnesia. And manganese as a metal is not what we'd call a magnet either. So it, it can get somewhat confusing. Uh, but uh, because magnetism and magnetite and uh, magnetotacticity and so many other terms come from this one word, you can sometimes construct complex sentences. Like you can say, you can refer to, for example, the magnetism arising from the magnetite particles and magnetotactic bacteria. Okay, and that sentence makes sense. <laughs> 
So the recognition that magnets align themselves along certain directions was apparently used extensively by fortune tellers to, to for example, divine things and to, to, to look at boards where they, where they plotted their astrological chart. But I guess one of these fortune tellers, or, or many as is often the case, <coughs> inventions and discoveries often come from many sources, figured out that uh, it might actually do a little more than tell fortunes, which is of course important. It might also be able to direct you if you're navigating. So the compass was known uh, as early as 1000 AD to Portuguese and uh, to, to Chinese and Arab navigators and so soon thereafter picked up by the Portuguese. And uh, in 1600, Queen Elizabeth's, this is, the, this is the first queen, Queen Elizabeth's personal physician, William Gilbert, wrote this book, The Magnator, where he described the earth as a large magnet and he, uh, he described the workings of compasses and so on. So this recognition that the earth itself has a magnetic field uh, and that compasses basically align themselves with the earth's magnetic field was made uh, quite a long time ago. The curious thing is the magnetism of the earth is not, uh, and I think I'm accurate in saying this, is there are still uh, things about the magnetism of the earth which aren't completely understood. So it's very much something that people are uh, continuing to study. So moving on, in the 18th and 19th century, people actually started doing experiments. And this is, this is, this is quite a departure from, for example, the Greek philosophizing. Uh, in, in the times of Aristotle and others, people didn't believe in experiments. But by the time of Galileo and so on, people actually started dropping things off buildings and, 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 uh, and watching uh, magnets stick to one another and so on. So these two people in the 17th century, in the, in the 18th century, I'm sorry, John Michel and, in, in England and, and Charles Coulomb in, in France came up with the idea of magnetic poles and how they interact. And this, this depiction of a magnet that it has a north and a south pole dates back to them. And then Michael Faraday, who was a famous experimenter, he called himself an experimental philosopher and, and he was, of course, vastly prolific. He believed that he shouldn't go to bed without doing a bunch of experiments. You know, probably the most prolific experimenter ever. He did a lot of work on magnetism and he worked out the theories of magnetic field lines and so on. These are the so-called lines of force that emanate from a magnet. So if you have a magnet, and this is my first demo, you can you can visualize these lines of forces by placing iron filings on top of a magnet and the iron filings which are attracted to the magnet basically trace the magnetic lines of force. So if I, if I work this out very carefully, uh, I hope you can see this there, if I work this out very carefully I can actually draw out the lines that emanate from the magnet and thereby for one thing determine the strength of the magnet. The strength of magnets is essentially a count of the number of lines that come out of a unit surface of the magnet. So I can uh, pass this demo around uh, for you people later perhaps, but you, I will ask you to be a little careful because the iron particles are somewhat fine and they can fly. And then in the 18th and 19th centuries, there was this recognition that, the f <coughs> particularly in the 19th century, there's this recognition that magnetism is very closely related to the phenomenon of electricity. So, uh, for example, Hans Christian Oersted in Denmark recognized, and the story goes that he was doing experiments with voltaic piles, which were the electric batteries that people used in those days. And he was separately doing experiments with a magnetic compass. But he noticed that sometimes when he turned these voltaic piles on, the magnetic compass showed a small deflection. And he later researched this phenomenon and, and determined that any current carrying wire is also associated with a magnetic field. And then in the, in the 19th century, of course, there were many others. There, was, there were Bio and Sava in France, and there was uh, Lorenz in, in Germany who, who continued to work on, on the connection between electricity and magnetism. And of course, the unifying theory for this came was given by Clerk Maxwell. In, uh, who lived from 1831 to 1879, and these are called Maxwell's equations. So uh, I should say that the phen phenomenology of magnetism, which means 
how you understand magnets if you look at them externally, not if you look at, for example, the constitution and so on. That took till the 20th century. But how magnets behave with respect to one another, what you'd ob observe from outside, was somewhat well understood already by the mid-19th century, largely because of the work of people like Faraday, Orsted, and Maxwell. So there are different kinds of magnetism. Uh, I'm approximately going to classify magnetism into three different kinds of magnetism. Uh, there, one might sort of fine tune this further and, and, and subdivide these further, but I'm going to say that basically the first class is what is called diamagnetism. Now diamagnetism is an effect that's possessed by all bodies, even ferromagnets, everything you can name has this property, except this phenomenon is very weak. So in the presence of any other form of magnetism, you don't see it. Diamagnetism is very weak and it's characterized by its ability, by the ability of a diamagnet to repel magnetic field lines. So if I bring a magnetic field near a diamagnet, the field lines which come out of the, uh, out of the magnet are pushed out by the diamagnet. Okay? And water is diamagnetic, so because water is diamagnetic and most uh, living organisms are compri comprised of water, largely water, you can actually, if you, if you build up a strong enough magnetic field, you can actually float uh, a human or a frog. And I actually have uh, a movie to show. I'm afraid I'll have to go offline for this. But uh, here is the movie of a frog being floated in a magnetic field. So this was done in. So I'm 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 uh, I'm um, I gather that no nothing was harmed in the making of this <laughs> picture. Uh, the the really curious thing about this experiment actually is that they could do it with the frog being alive and at room temperature. Normally, to attain very high magnetic fields, you also have to go to very low temperatures, typically 4.2 Kelvin, which is the <laughs> boiling point of, which is the boiling point of helium, and it's not a temperature that frogs are normally comfortable with. So, so, uh, uh, so this particular experiment and and the and the image comes from uh, work that was done uh, in the in the. University of Nijmegen and in the European High Field Magnet Lab there. So this was done with a 16 Tesla magnet. It's a kind of magnetic field that really requires a national facility. In fact, I once heard a talk about an experiment done at this facility where they at attained a very high magnetic field and while they were reaching that field, they were actually using 1% of the Netherlands power supply. <laughs> so to attain these magnetic fields really are major experiments. So this is an example of diamagnetic levitation. So the frog is floating, or <coughs> levitating if you will, because of this high field literally being pushed out by the frog. And you don't normally, as I said, you don't normally see this phenomenon because you require very high fields. It's a very weak phenomenon. The second phenomenon, uh, the second kind of magnetism is paramagnetism. And this is associated, I'll come back to this point, this is associated with systems having unpaired electrons. So whenever in an atom or in a molecule there are unpaired electrons, now, and electrons, I should tell you, like to pair up, but you can engineer atoms and molecules so that you have unpaired electrons, and when you have unpaired electrons, you start seeing this phenomenon of paramagnetism. You then say the atom or the molecule and one very good example of a paramagnetic molecule is oxygen. Oxygen is actually paramagnetic, unlike nitrogen, which is, which is diamagnetic. So when oxygen has unpaired spins, you assign this whole oxygen molecule with a spin, and you say the material is paramagnetic. The characteristic of paramagnetic materials is unlike diamagnetic mater materials, they are attracted to a magnetic field. Again, not very strongly. Though you can, for example, demonstrate this if you have access to liquid oxygen. Now, I'm, I should point out that this is not an experiment to be tried at home. Liquid oxygen boils at about 80 Kelvin. It's very cold, but that's not really the danger associated with liquid oxygen. The danger is that it produces such high local pressures of oxygen gas that everything catches fire. You know, so, <laughs> it's, uh, so it's actually, the, the hazard there is not 
a cryogenic hazard. It's not a hazard associated with low temperatures. It's a hazard of pyrophoricity associated with oxygen's ability to set things on fire. So as you see in the image, the oxygen is being poured between the poles of a strong electromagnet and it's actually been being held between the poles. So I would have liked to have made this demonstration, but it's not a very safe one to, to do. So oxygen is a paramagnet and it's attracted by the magnetic field. It's actually held on there. So any system with unpaired electrons has this property that it's paramagnetic and it's attracted to a magnetic field. The kind of magnetism that we associate with the term magnet is actually a special class of paramagnets. So some paramagnetic systems are extremely strong in their attraction to a magnetic field and these are now called ferromagnets. The term ferromagnet comes from the fact that all the early work on magnets involved iron and iron is ferro, is ferrous, ferrum in Latin. So it's characterized by a very strong attraction to a magnetic field and frequently the material will also have a memory of having been left in a magnetic field and I will sort of elaborate this point as I go along. So as I was saying, materials that we refer to as magnets such as, for example, these are now small pieces of, these are now small pieces of ferrite, uh, 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 the same material uh, that you find in lodestone. Th this is a ferromagnetic material. This is, I'll show you another material. This is now an extremely strong magnet. It's not necessarily, magnets like this don't necessarily need to have iron. So these, I'm sorry, it's a very, very, very strong. So the, these are actually magnets with neodymium, iron and boron, but you could similarly make them with samarium and cobalt. And these are extremely strong magnets. In fact, there is, if, you're, if you're playing with them, there's often a danger that they'll snap together and shatter or they'll pinch your fingers. So these are not experiments to be tried by school children, for example. So, <laughs> so uh, at least not with these strong magnets. So ferro comes from the phenomenon being associated with iron. And I'm going to tell you now about what makes a paramagnet a ferromagnet. So the experiment that you do very simply is, and I'll show you how this is done, you measure something called the magnetization, which you could, which you could say approximately is the, uh, is the attraction that the material has for the magnetic field. Okay? You just measure this attraction for the magnetic field and you start measuring it at some high temperature and as you lower the temperature, all of a sudden the material undergoes what is called a phase transition. And what happens during the phase transition, so as I was saying, this is a paramagnets have unpaired spins. So imagine that these are the spins on the atoms arising from these unpaired electrons. These spins can be thought of as tiny little magnets in themselves. In the paramagnetic phase, which is above this temperature, these spins are randomly arranged. Okay? They're, being, they're swirling around, being buffeted by thermal forces and so on. But below this temperature, all of a sudden, the spins like to line up and the magnetization suddenly shoots up. So the spins all line up like this. This temperature is referred to as a Curie temperature. So this, this Curie here actually refers to the husband and the brother-in-law of Madame Curie who did these experiments before Pierre Curie married uh, uh, Marie Curie um, or Marie Sklodowska. And for iron, this Curie temperature, as it's now called, is at 1143 Kelvin or about 870 degrees centigrade. So any iron sample at room temperature is a ferromagnet. So here, for example, is an iron, um, is a, is an iron bolt that I acquired when they were expanding this building. And I, <laughs> I, I hope that the building doesn't fall as a result of this acquisition. But um, this is a ferromagnet and it's very strongly attracted it's very strongly attracted to a permanent magnet, as you see. It's very strongly attracted to a permanent magnet. Okay. So, so that is because this material is below the Curie temperature. If we warmed it up above the Curie temperature, there would not be this strong attraction. 
So how do you measure the magnetization that I showed you in, in the previous experiment? This is not precisely how we do it. We don't use a, a beam balance like, we, we, me, like, like uh, we are measuring out vegetables in the farmer's market or something. We use basically an electrobalance and we just suspend the sample in a magnetic field. We measure the mass of the sample when the field is on and we measure the mass of the sample when the field is off. And depending on the change in the mass that we observe, we get some idea about how strongly magnetic the sample is. So if I now put a diamagnetic sample in the magnetic field, I would be able to measure that the mass actually reduces when I turn the magnetic field on. But for, for a sample of iron, for example, the mass will increase very greatly, or if you like, the force on that sample will increase very greatly when you turn a magnetic field on. So this is how the measurements are done. The important question you might want to ask <coughs> is if iron is ferromagnetic at room temperature, why do, why do these things not attract one another? Okay? And for that you have to actually look at another level of complexity in a magnetic material and these are called magnetic domains. So I told you that unlike in a paramagnet where the spins are random, they are not aligned properly, in a ferromagnet the spins are all aligned. But they are aligned within what are called domains, which are basically clusters of spins. And the domains themselves can either be misaligned or aligned. When they are misaligned, the material is referred to as being demagnetized. And really, what I have here with these, with these iron, uh, with these, with this iron, uh, these two pieces of iron, is that they're de they've been demagnetized. They're not magnetic. Okay, but. On the other, so the domains in this material are misaligned. On the other hand, the domains in these, in these two pieces of, of uh, neodymium ion boron magnets are strongly, in fact, very strongly aligned. Okay? They're very strongly aligned. Uh, likewise, these, these pieces of, these little pieces of ferrite. And in fact, one of the characteristics of materials like this ferrite and like the neodymium iron boron that I showed you, is once you magnetize it, once you bring it into this state, it's rather hard for it to go back to this state. And that's why it's actually called a hard magnet. But iron, if you bring it into this state, and you can easily bring it into this state by taking a piece of iron and exposing it to a magnet. But if I remove the magnet, so when I do this, the domains here are aligned by the magnet. But when I remove the magnet, it basically forgets that it was magnetized very quickly and it goes from being aligned or magnetized to misaligned or demagnetized. So domains explain why two pieces of iron don't normally attract uh, each other. Iron is a soft magnet, easy to demagnetize. Hard magnets such as ferrites, on the other hand, can be demagnetized. But to do this, you typically will have to heat it to quite a high temperature. So what heating does basically is it gives the, I am going to heat it, I have a blowtorch. So what the heating does is it, uh, is it gives the domains enough energy that they can slip against each other and misalign. Okay? So here are two pieces of ferrite magnets and now I will actually hope that this experiment works. As I said, there are no guarantees. So they are sticking to one another. I'm going to separately heat them up using uh, my uh, student Eric Toberer at the back has lent me his blowtorch. He uses it, he says, to make creme brulee. <laughs> so I'm going to use this to, to heat this up. And I really have to heat it up to quite a high temperature, typically till it's about red. And then if the experiment works, if the magnet has been properly demagnetized, it should no longer stick to, for example, that iron. Uh, okay, I'm not really certain that this is going to work as I'm hoping it will. So I have to be careful because it's still hot. But if this, were, if, this, if this did work, it should not, oh, it is still attracted. <laughs> okay, but let's see. Let's see now. Let's see now how the other one is attracted. So, did, you, did it? Sorry, I'm sorry. Here's the, here's the cold one. 
this is much more vigorous, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's very kind of you. It's, it's kind of you. But, uh, but, but perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, if Eric was still here, I can request him to operate the blowtorch a little more and, and bring back one of these magnets after they have been, uh, after they have been properly demagnetized. Perhaps by the end of the talk, I can uh, show you this experiment. Thank you. Be careful, it might be hot. Thank you. So basically what heating does is it converts these aligned domains to misaligned domains. So how do you then make a permanent magnet? Firstly, you must choose a material that remembers when it's magnetized. And I'll come back to this point because this is a very important point. And then effectively what you have to do is you have to warm up the material and cool it down in a magnetic field. And when you do that, all the domains become aligned. And if the material is well chosen, like a ferrite or the neodymium ion boron that I showed you, it, rem it remembers that it was magnetized. And it it's then what we call a magnet. Because really what we call magnets are these, are these permanent magnets. And uh, we don't call iron, for example, a magnet, even though iron is also, in principle, a magnet. OK, so let me tell you a little bit about the process of this memory. And this is called magnetic hysteresis. The experiment we do to demonstrate this phenomenon is once we are in the ferromagnetic regime, so we must be below the Curie temperature. If you are below the Curie temperature, I don't need this. If you are below the Curie temperature, we can put the magnetic material in a magnetic field. And let me try and let me try. We can put the magnetic material in a magnetic field, and then we can basically start ramping up the field and monitoring the magnetization. So as the field goes up, the magnetization increases. Basically, this means that the domains are going from a misaligned state shown here to an aligned state shown here as we warm up the material, as we, sorry, as we ramp the field up. We ramp it up until what? what is called saturation happens. Basically, it flattens, it starts flattening out. So increasing the field further beyond this point no longer uh, increases the magnetization. And then we start ramping the field down in the other direction. And when we do that, we find, we're now going like that, we find the material remembers that it has been magnetized and it does not demagnetize easily. If it came back here to zero magnetization, that means it's gone to this completely demagnetized state. But when we, we are bringing it down from this magnetized state, it remembers that it was magnetized. And this is actually the basis of magnetic memory. I'm actually giving this talk from a computer on whose hard disk drive I've stored my talk. The way I've stored my talk is my talk is converted into a stream of zeros and ones. And it the talk basically becomes incomprehensible, which I hope it isn't in reality. <laughs> but these zeros and ones are stored on this magnetic hard disks as small regions that are magnetized if they are one, or not magnetized if they are zero. Then what the read head on the hard disk drive has to do is literally pick up the string of ones and zeros and convert that into the talk. Okay? So this is the phenomenon of magnetic memory. What happens if we continue this process? We can scan the field both in the positive and negative directions. So as we scan it up, the magnetization rises like this. As we bring it down again, the magnetization comes down until it saturates in the negative field direction. And then again, we can start scanning. But this time, we obtain this trace, basically a different trace altogether. Because again, there are memory effects of the negative field. So this is the phenomenon of memory. And this is a property that all hard magnetic materials, such as the ferrite and such as the uh, neodymium ion boron have. And certainly, the hard disk on my computer has this. It's demagnetized or magnetized according to the data it's storing. And uh, if you wanted, for example, to destroy it, you could heat it up with a blowtorch. OK, but that goes without saying. <laughs> OK, so another interesting thing that a demo that one can do with magnets is one can make what are called ferrofluids, which are basically small magnetic particles dispersed in a liquid. So we have, for example, little particles of iron that have been ground down. And I'm going to demonstrate this. Uh, it will take me 
a second to focus in a little, to zoom in a little. So there is a, a little blob of ferrofluid. This particular ferrofluid has been stabilized in, uh, in, a, in a mineral oil. And what I'm going to do now, OK, stabilized in a mineral oil and then placed in a vial containing water, because uh, it turns out that this it makes the clearest demonstrations if you do it like this. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you that as I bring a magnet close to it, so here's my magnet, it starts, it starts reacting to the magnetic field. You see, and one of the things it does is it forms these very pretty fingers. <coughs> the, f the reason that it forms these fingers or spikes is because of the magnetic lines of force again. The liquid collects according to where the magnetic lines of force are highest. But the liquid is also being held together by the forces of surface tension, like how a balloon, uh, how, a, how a soap bubble is held together. So it's a combination of surface tension. And if you bring it from on top, which then makes the demo hard to see, but if you bring it from on top, it's a combination of gravity, surface tension, and the magnetic lines of force. But I hope you can see this experiment. And, uh, and uh, there, that's about the limit of my, the influence of my magnetic field, and there's no longer any magnetic field. So again, uh, uh, we are very happy to demonstrate these experiments after the talk, and, and we can perhaps even make some of this material available to you. OK, uh, available to take back. OK, so uh, uh, what, are, what are such ferrofluids used for? One very interesting application of ferrofluids is that, uh, is that uh, you can use them for lubricating objects in such a way that the fluid doesn't, the lubricating fluid remains always stuck to the material that it's lubricating because it's magnetic. And in fact, it's used in seals. In, uh, if, you, if you want to have seals in, out in space and so on, it's a very useful material uh, for, such, uh, uh, for such purposes. It's also used a lot for damping vibrations. So if you have a magnet in a ferrofluid, it's very hard to to push the material, so it's a very good vibrational damper. So there are many, many such uses. It's also actually been used quite a bit to do lab experiments that are aimed at understanding the Earth's magnetic field. So this is a very clever application of ferrofluids. People try and do little experiments on a bench top in order to model what the magnetic, how the magnetic field of the Earth behaves. So what are the new surprises in the in the area. Well, one big new, well, it's not so new, but it's continuing to be studied. One uh, a very uh, important surprise is this, <coughs> is, the, is the increasing awareness that a lot of, uh, well, it started with bacteria, but increasingly it's becoming clear that a number of vertebrates use magnetic fields to align themselves. So it's, it's, it's a little small. So this is an article by Joseph Kirschwink in Nature from uh, 1997. He says, imagine being set adrift in a canoe in the middle of an ocean. Which way would you paddle? Most humans would be as lost as lost can be. But creatures such as pigeons, turtles, and whales have no difficulty navigating under such circumstances. And this has, of course, been a puzzle for a very long time. You know, how do pigeons know how to get home? Uh, uh, or uh, if, 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 they're, if they're homing pigeons, or how do, how do, for example, salmon know which way to go up and spawn? Uh, so the first studies on so-called magnetotacticity, or this magnetotactile response, the response of living organisms to the Earth's magnetic field, was performed in bacteria. In fact, uh, uh, speaking, of, uh, speaking of long names, uh, the standard bacterium for this is called Magnetospirillium magnetotacticum. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, it, these are magnetite particles in the bacteria that give it the magnetotactic property. Here, for example, is an image from the same Nature article of magnetite particles found in the frontal lobe of the sockeye salmon. So the sockeye salmon, well, I think it's non-trivial to demonstrate that it's actually using these things to navigate. But it does have the compass built in, basically. Okay. Maybe it's just using it to make demos for little kids, little salmon kids. But, uh, I, but, but I think the, the most people would think that it's probably to, uh, to, to navigate. So this has been something that's increasingly uh, being studied. And in fact, it's very, it's very current to, to, to sort of illustrate this. 
I'm showing you a very recent Nature uh, article from 2006. And uh, this is about how these magnetite particles are aligned. This is again in a, in a magnetotactic bacteria, Magnetospirillium Greifswald NZ uh, from, uh, from uh, the Greifswald region in southern Germany. And these are magnetite particles. Now what these creatures are very good at doing is that they're very good at aligning these particles because by aligning the particles, they're basically making a compass needle. Okay? They don't have the technology to actually forge a needle, but they can make lots of little particles and line them up. So this is basically the, the bacterium's uh, compass needle. And you see the whole bacterium is about this big. So this is a pretty serious endeavor for the bacterium. And what uh, these uh, researchers have discovered is that there's a particular protein that helps align the so-called uh, uh, magnetosomal structures and helps align all these particles within them. And in fact, using the techniques of genetic engineering, they're able to switch this protein off. So you go from what they call the wild type to the engineered type. By switching the proteins off, they no longer form these compass-like structures. Mm -hmm. There have also been recent articles on the purpose of these, of these magnetotactic bacteria because it isn't entirely clear how, how these, uh, these bacterium align in magnetic fields. So this is, this, it was thought that they, they, used the, they used their compasses to align themselves in a sort of north-south direction along with the Earth's magnetic field, but this has some been called into question. This is not entirely clear. So, so certainly magnetism in biology is something that's being much studied. I should tell you that I personally am very intrigued by, if you like, this resurgence of magnetism in biology. Because as I was saying, 200 years ago, people said magnetism and warm ale would cure, a, a cure an upset stomach. And, and in fact, there was, uh, th uh, around the time of Franz Mesmer and mesmerism in Austria, people used magnetic therapy and so on quite a bit. And, uh, and uh, in those days, uh, if you didn't believe it, you'd say the people doing it are charlatans. And now, uh, all of a sudden, uh, it's become uh, reasonable to say that magnets do play a, a role in, in the brains of, uh, of at least of pigeons and bees and, uh, and salmon, if not humans. So uh, th the last topic that I want to uh, very briefly discuss, as I was saying, the, the, the old phenomenon but new surprises. The new surprise in, um, is that I want to present here is the idea that in, a, in the usual electronic circuits that we make use of, we manipulate electrons in solid state devices. For example, if you, in any solid state device, an amplifier, a receiver, any solid state device, we amplify electrons, we rectify them, we transmit them and so on. But what we are manipulating as far as the electron goes is the charge on the electron. So we amplify charge, we rectify, in a, in a stereo amplifier. We rectify charge when we're converting from AC to DC. We uh, manipulate charge in other ways. We transmit charge through, through power lines, etc. The question that is increasingly being asked is that electrons have not only charge, they also have this other phenomenon that is spin. That's what gives rise to magnetism. Can we actually manipulate spin? And this has given rise to a, a new subject of study. It's been referred to as spintronics. And the idea is that with the right materials, you can use the spin as well as the charge on electrons to do a lot of processes in a much more efficient way, use much less power, faster computing, uh, more efficient computing, greater miniaturization. So in my computer, I use the charge on electrons to do the processing, to handle binary 0 and binary 1 or to process signals. But the storage is done with spin, as I just told you. It's storage is done by regions that are mag of magnetization or demagnetization. Can these be combined? So this is a very exciting challenge that's facing those of us who work in magnetism. So I think I'll uh, conclude with that. And basically, the message that I've tried to convey is that while magnets have been around for a long time, there's quite a lot left to be understood and many new applications to be explored. So those of us who work in the area hope to remain in business for some time yet. <laughs> so thank you.
And uh, we are now happy to take questions, but please do speak into the microphone. Could you talk about um, Earth's magnetic reversals um, just, just a little bit and talk about uh, if you think we're in the middle of one, or, and if so, how long you think that might happen in? In fact, I, n I know no more than you do that the magnetic field does reverse. Uh, that's, that's the extent of my knowledge. And uh, I have heard that people are anticipating such a reversal sometime soon, but soon on ge geological timescales could be <laughs> one year or a thousand. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't call a thousand years soon, at least I won't wait for it. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I know no more than you do. I know that it is known that the Earth's magnetic field reverses. And in fact, uh, Dotty here can perhaps answer this question better than I can. But let me tell you about an interesting thing with the magnetotactic bacteria and the reversal of the Earth's magnetic field. Apparently, a certain proportion of the magnetotactic bacteria have their compasses messed up. They're pointing the wrong way. But it's that proportion that survives the Earth's magnetic field reversal. So it's that, that, that little error, if you like, has been engineered into them in order to handle the reversal of the Earth's magnetic field, or at least that's one theory. But I'm sorry, I don't know more than what I just said about the reversal. I got a question, but just to comment on that, um, the magnetic pole is drifting towards the North Pole, and that'd be nice because then you wouldn't have any variation. Right. Uh, th so this is the other thing, which of course many of you know that the that the that that the, the, that the compass actually doesn't point towards the North Pole. It points towards the magnetic North Pole, which is not not precisely coincident with the no with the North Pole, and the magnetic North Pole drifts around. My question is. Um, are, are, are you addressing uh, the, um, the technology of uh, magnetic bearings as opposed to ball bearings, or especially with this kind of system? Yes. So uh, uh, this is uh, something that is much explored with uh, the use of, ma of, of ferrofluids in bearings uh, is much explored, and that is their principal current use. They're used, for example, uh, in bearings, particularly when you have to run bearings through uh, pressure differentials or differentials in media, if you have a liquid on one side and another kind of liquid on another, you want a magnetic bearing in between to act both as a, as a bearing material and as a sealant. Yes, so the answer is yes. Is there a question? Can you tell us anything else about these transparent magnets? So, uh, so the interest in them actually arises partly from the interest that I just mentioned uh, here in this area called spintronics. So to, you, to perform spintronics, you in effect need semiconductors that are also magnetic. So at least certain operations in spintronic circuitries require semiconducting materials like, like silicon would be a typical semiconducting material but you'd also wish it to be magnetic. So where the, 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 where the relation between being a semiconductor and being magnetic comes in, being, or have being transparent and being magnetic comes in, is that semiconductors have what is called a band gap. And for a material to be transparent, you need this thing called a band gap. So that is, that is the interest in transparent magnets. The problem is that when you have these pictures that I showed you, I don't want to go back in the talk, but you have these pictures that I showed you of spins lining up in a ferromagnet. One way that the spins know how to line up in a material like this uh, piece of iron here is that uh, the electrons in the material convey the information from one spin to another. And if you have electrons jostling about in the material, they invariably are able to absorb light, so the material is no longer transparent. So most transparent materials that we know are also insulating. You can't get a, an electrical, you can't get electrical conduction through a window or through a sheet of clear plastic. So this is really the problem, that to get good magnetism, you need lots of free electrons. But if you have free electrons, they will absorb light. I, 
I have a question about uh, magnets. If you chop a magnet in half, it still has a north and south. And if you chop that magnet in half, it still has a north and south. And always, you keep cutting it down. How exactly does that work with uh, electron spin? You know, does that, what's the relationship? That, okay, that actually, that actually has to do with, that actually has to do with uh, not so much, you have for, for that you must look not at the level of individual spins, but you must look at the behavior of magnetic domains. And uh, I'm afraid the answer is going to be a little long-winded. So perhaps we can discuss this uh, uh, a little. Uh, we can discuss this after the talk. But it is true that if you break a magnet, you get two new magnets, both of which have a north and a south pole. And of course, if you break a magnet, you can't stick them back where you broke them. So as a consequence of that, these very strong magnets, when you hit them with a hammer, they shatter with great force and they actually uh, spread out into, into many, many very small pieces. But we'll come back to this, Stephen, after that. Um, there's this concept of ceramic magnets. Yes. And I, I, what are they made of and how do they differ from a normal ferrous magnet that we're so using? So uh, in fact, these ferrites are actually ceramic magnets. So the term ceramic is usually associated with a material that's an oxide. Um, because it's processed at high temperatures and so on. So the way you'd actually make this magnet is very much the way you'd make a ceramic pot. You'd take uh, the metal or you'd take its constituents and just heat it up at high temperatures and allow it to form. So, it, so this is a ceramic. As I said, lodestone, all, which is principally ferrite or magnetite, is Fe304, and this is Fe304. There are also some magnets made with strontium iron and oxygen that are commonly used. Some of the refrigerator magnets are this material. It's called a, it's, the structure is called a hexaferrite. It's a, it's a small modification on this structure. So these are ceramics uh, uh, in their, in, by definition, because they're oxides. So uh, are they fundamentally different from, uh, from metallic magnets like the neodymium iron boron? The, the answer to that is they can be. In fact, ferrite, which is or magnetite, which is the basis of all modern magnetism, is actually not a ferromagnet, as I showed you. Uh, this idea of all the spins lining up is actually not accurate. A more accurate description of ferrite is that there are large spins and small spins. So instead of showing it with, say, thumbs, I'll show it with a thumb and a little finger. And the little finger opposes the thumb, but as, you, as they don't cancel each other, you get a net magnetic moment, and this is propagated through the lattice. So sometimes, the answer to your question is sometimes the ceramics can be quite different from the metallic magnets, not necessarily. Um, how did you make the ferrofluids? Because that's oh, not they're my, rather a simple teacher, to can... make. You can make ferrofluids just by precipitating ferrite, the same material uh, as 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 this. You can you can precipitate it as a small as small particles by just taking solutions of iron or even better iron with a little cobalt and adding base to it, and these things start precipitating out. And once they've precipitated out, you have to treat their surfaces so that they don't stick to one another and they can be dispersed. <laughs> but it's relatively simple to do. You have to treat it with, uh, with uh, something called uh, ammonium hydroxide, tetrabutyl ammonium hydroxide or tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide. Relatively simple to make ferrofluids. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.